Welcome from the IIBA Tampa Bay, Florida chapter. This is our study group, 31st in a row for April 2022. This will be our last study group for the month of April. I uh, appreciate you joining. Uh, our mission here at the IBA Tampa Bay is to bridge the gap between industry leaders and business analysts by building partnerships with professionals, educators, and employers so that we may empower, instruct, and engage the Tampa Bay IT community. Now, I want you to understand that Tampa Bay IT community is not just the Tampa Bay area. We actually have the northern half of Florida, and we have members from all over the world. So if you're interested in joining the IBA, we would welcome you to join the Ta Tampa Bay IT community in, with the IBA from Tampa Bay. Uh, it is our job to empower you, to mentor you, to teach you, to help you with your resume, to help you find a job, to, to network, to review um, your job search strategy, to help you with your LinkedIn profile, uh, to tell you about some of these techniques that we're talking about. Uh, to access us, you can reach us through a variety of ways. You are currently in our study group. As you know, it's Tuesdays from 7 to 8 p.m. Eastern Time. We also have our meetup. We have Zoom online. We have all of our past, well, almost all of our past uh, meetings in recordings, and here's the address. Uh, we also have our IBA site, websites, meetup, Facebook, and two different LinkedIn ways. Uh, you can reach most of us through one of these areas. Let me give you a breakdown. Uh, let's get that for now. Uh, this is our board. Uh, Cliff Gray is our president. He's online with us now. Lori, Caitlin, and Priscilla are members of our board. Uh, my name is Thea Tanner Raisins. Um, I'm the vice president of career and professional development for this chapter. Tiffany Gardner leans in occasionally to help us teach. Bob Churchill is online with us tonight. He has earned his CBAP certification from the IBA. He's also earned a variety of other very impressive titles that he has strung after his name. This is not all of them, I assure you. He also has a blog site that he has, what did he say, uh, over almost 400 different articles of things that are of interest to business analysts, but not only business analysts, uh, project managers, mechanical engineers, uh, agile, uh, quality assurance, P, uh, total quality management, all kinds of really impressive things that you need to be aware of, at least that they exist as a resource on his blog site. Uh, you can see his email right there. He's very responsive and uh, wonderful to deal with. Uh, as I said, we've recorded our past meetings. Uh, you can see the meeting number here of what we actually went over. Originally, we were going over the uh, practice study questions, uh, test questions, and what I really enjoyed about these meetings is that we would have conversations about why this answer was more right than the next answer. And occasionally we were wrong. As you can see, our scores were not awesome, but what we did is we learned from our mistakes. And you're welcome to review those in, in these uh, classes that are recorded. Now, uh, we do keep attendance and uh, we will take a screenshot of the attendance and put it in here. Some of y'all on your attendance sheet, it, it will tell us your first name, but it will not tell us your last name. And for us to give you credit for attending this class, we need to know your full name. Uh, I think there's one person, her name is Brenda. I don't know who Brenda is and I can't give her credit until I have her full name. So be sure that you're, you're uh, not only logged in for the entire meeting, but that you participate and we will be asking for feedback on some of the uh, presentations as we go through them. Now tonight we have uh, these items that we're going to go over. Uh, Bob Churchill is going to go over state modeling and then Tish Bell is going to go over the SWOT analysis which is SWOT and then she's also going to go over vendor assessment. We have a couple of other items scheduled for the next two weeks. You can see that they're listed here. We will also be publishing this in the comment section of our LinkedIn, uh, uh, what's it called, post about the classes that are upcoming. So you can also go back and say you wanted to learn about data dictionary on 315, we covered data dictionary. 
So I'm going to turn it over to Bob right now so he can start state modeling and um, get the party started. Take it away, Bob. Hello, can everyone hear me? We can, and we can see your screen. Okay, fantastic. So what do we mean by state? Um, usually, when we think of state, we think of the states in matter, solid, liquid, gas. Um, one of the things I learned when I studied thermodynamics way back in the day was um, how water behaves in all those states as a function of temperature, pressure, specific volume, and so on, and that's plotted on the surface. Um, water is actually a very fascinating substance. I won't go into it, but just know that there's a lot of possible complexity. Every element and substance have these um, similar diagrams uh, with additional complexity to even beyond this. Um, depending on their chemical and physical structure. And uh, there are other states of matter too. There's a plasma state where um, the material is so energetic, the electrons won't stay in orbit around the atomic nuclei. And so you just have a mass of Stuff. And then also, there's a super cold state called the Bose Einstein condensate, where there's so little energy, the atoms don't maintain their um, uh, structure and they collapse, and you would just end up with a pile of stuff just sitting there. So, um, and there are other weird states too for glass and polymers and other weird things. Now, as business analysts, you don't care about any of that, um, but it's a place to start thinking about state. So uh, a more general way to think about state is it's any descriptor that can have different discrete values. And an object may have many different descriptors that all represent different kinds of states. For example, an aircraft can have a bunch of different maintenance states and a refueling state and a passenger loaded state. And um, all those things have to be set into ready mode for the uh, aircraft to be able to fly, for example. So states get very complicated. Every state is a function of some other characteristics, like uh, passengers might be, um, you know, everybody that had a reservation uh, is on the plane like five minutes before departure might be one definition. Or uh, for fuel, you need 120% uh, of the amount of fuel needed to get to the destination. And there, uh, the logic for every one of those can be as complicated as you'd like. So if we think about... Um, water, for example, we might define a mass of water 
um, to talk about a specific volume or collection of water, not just water in general, right? We might specify its temperature, pressure, and other characteristics, and that'll tell us what state it's in, and then that will tell us what behavior it may exhibit. Or um, if we think of water as an object, we can think of it having numerous um, characteristics. So in object notation, we call them um, attributes, right? All the values are attributes. In computer science, they'll all be variables within a structure or an object. Associated actions might be called methods, and there is a, a large rabbit hole. You can go down there. So uh, every entity in a system, and this applies to business systems too. So you can think that documents have states, um, accounts have states like payment um, due, payment overdue, payment received, that kind of thing. Um, you have to send out communications. Um, employees can be present or not, or trained or qualified in certain things. So you can make these as detailed and crazy as you want. Again, like so much of this stuff, it's limited only by your imagination. So we talk about any of these having states and the way I think of a system is they all have these fairly standard components. So um, stuff comes in and stuff goes out and stuff moves through and uh, there are cues where stuff waits and collects they can be FIFO and not FIFO. So in those cases, you might call them a bag or a parking lot. Um, you can combine stuff to make um, groups or facilities or whatever, like a department of insurance underwriters um, would be a group or a facility. So it's like one process made up of many sub processes that all do the same work in parallel. Uh, and then things go out and entities can uh, move through the system or move within it. For example, I worked on aircraft maintenance models where the aircraft were in different states and they kind of move within the model, um, but they never come in and out. A credit card processor will usually deal with stuff coming through the system and exiting. So there are a lot of ways to handle it. Um, so, in general terms, an entity could be any of those items, and um, all of those entities can have states. For example, if you look at uh, some of the process stations, some of them are red and some are green. So, the red ones mean uh, this cannot accept new entities because they're full at the time or they're in work. Um, whereas the green ones, nothing is in them, so they can accept entities. You might have hours of operation, so sometimes things are closed and sometimes things are open, those are all states. Uh, 
All right, I go through several examples of um, things in writing there. Most of those I've just discussed with you. So uh, let's talk about state models, which is what this is about. Um, interestingly, um, you might see the Babak, which is printed in Canada, talking about state modeling with two L's. The U.S. spelling only has one L. So Canada works the way British and uh, Australian and all the Commonwealth countries. So both spellings are correct. I'm an American, I use one L if anyone has questions. So uh, model has to describe all the possible states and any they can be in. Um, the sequence of states it can be in. So sometimes there's a progression or there's a limit of what states can be transitioned into from other states. So this is potentially complicated. You have to be very clear and defined with all this stuff. You need to know how the entity changes states. What is the logic and what associated operations happen when that happens? Um, then you need to know the events and conditions that cause the changes of state. So sometimes, um, there was an event that just goes and sets the new state that's easy, right? But sometimes there have to be processes that um, go and pull various values on kind of a pull basis and that calculates the state. So that's a total implementation detail that your coders weren't whomever will have to deal with. Finally, um, there's the actions or, that are permitted or required by an entity in each state. So again, um, some things may or may not be possible depending on the state. Um, here is a diagram uh, for the way vehicles used to travel through land border crossings and the simulation models we built. So uh, working from top to bottom, there's a percentage chance they might go to any given uh, destination from uh, any given location and then uh, Depending on what location you're in, only certain subsequent locations are possible. So that's a kind of state diagram. Uh, when the, depending on the result of the inspection, say at the um, commercial primary station, which is the first inspection point or process that'll determine then it'll set the state and determine where it has to go next. Um, here is a, a, just a totally notional uh, description or object model of an aircraft so there are a lot of um, attributes of the aircraft that are very general, like its model, its length and dimensions and so on. Um, and it can have a status, which is a kind of operating state, and it can have ready to depart as an overall state that's a function of all the feeding states. In uh, every, 
there are many different feeding states based on whether certain kinds of maintenance operations have been performed. Um, there may be situations where maintenance allows only certain kinds of operations. For example, if the heating unit is uh, not working in the pet storage area in the lower hold, then the aircraft won't be able to transport pets there, but can still fly, um, you know, every other kind of passenger overload. So these things can be, like I said, as complicated as you want to make them. And uh, you had to be very, very careful about defining the stage and transitions and verbiage. And uh, next week, I guess, we scheduled to uh, talk about reviews. So many types of reviews will have to be conducted to ensure everyone is on the same sheet of music. And that's all I've got there. Thank you, Bob. I'd like to talk real quick about how I use state diagram in, in an effective way that was helpful to my stakeholders. Uh, at Hallmark, we had customers, we called them, we called them our friends, but we had customers that were in different states. And being able to name those different states helped people understand what we were talking about. So we had people that were they only came into retail stores. We had customers that applied for credit. We had customers that were, uh, they were part of a special club. So each one of those, those customers got different privileges. They got different things sent to them. They purchased different amounts. And then those that were in special clubs that purchased a huge amount, they were sometimes invited to events. So all of these customers were in different states. Um, I've also had uh, use of state states to describe the different uh, stages that a customer would go through whenever they were going through an application for insurance. So those states were important that people understood the different states. So we knew where they were in the process, what they were applying, what uh, parts of the application would apply to them, what rules would apply to them because rules change sometimes based on the state. So having the state laid out so that people sometimes get a graphical uh, representation of each of those states, help people understand it and keep it straight. Does anybody have any questions for Bob? A picture is worth a thousand words. So I'm always very big on creating diagrams for everything. Right. Any questions? I have a question about um, the diagram specifically. Is there a software you prefer to use to build your diagrams on? I tend to use everything in Visio. Or uh, if I'm doing a simulation model, I'll actually write a program that'll do the state model. Um, um, but sort of in animation and it'll be active, but I know how to program and do all the graphics and animation. And most people as BAs don't, um, but that's how I do it. Now you can certainly work with somebody who does that. And I think there are tools um, that help you do that but i don't know what they are because i don't need to basically a diagram for a state model or any diagram is only as effective as it's it provides value to your users so you can make it really complicated and it becomes where they, they can't understand it keep it as simple as possible generally just uh, circles and links 
with the circles or the states and the links or the conditions for the transition and also the permission. It's almost they like a be directional. I mean, they don't have to be complicated. It kind of looks like a basic board game in some cases. You know, this player moves from this state, goes through this event, and goes into this other state. So just make it where it's understandable. Yep. Yes, principle. Yes. Any other questions or comments? Has anyone used a state diagram? Okay, Tish, take it away. You're going to present two different uh, techniques. Do whichever one you want first. You know how to share your screen? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm gonna see if this is, is it sharing now? Not yet, keep going. Oh, it says you are the co-host. Oh, click share. Okay. okay. <laughs> so tonight, um, I'm talking about vendor assessment. So a little bit, I, I did pull this up off of the internet. A little bit of my background is I work in affordable housing um, and we provide you know, affordable housing. We actually go into apartment um, public housing complexes and we renovate them. So when I got to the section on vendor assessment, I was like, oh, I could talk about that because we use a lot of vendors in our business. And because we're a government, well, we're a private agency, but we're working with the government, we have a very um, strict process in how we use or how we choose our vendors. So I know here um, in the Bay Bot, and I don't want to read it verbatim, but it, you know, it says here that the vendor assessment it assesses the ability of a vendor to meet commitments regarding the delivery and the consistent provision of a product or a service. So um, when we do our you know, vendor assessments, one of the things that we look at, of course, is like the financial stability of the vendor. We had a situation where we were putting in um, new appliances in 361 units. After we purchased the appliances, because we failed to do a thorough vendor assessment early on, the company went bankrupt within two months. So here we are with 361 appliances with, with literally no type of warranties. So um, in just working with our risk assessment team to come up with like a checklist, even though I have a checklist here, a little bit similar to what we do, um, we looked at the financial stability, we looked at um, the reputation of the vendors as well, you know, how, what the reviews that they have online, the reviews that um, they have received from other companies that have used them, even their reviews like, on social media, because in our industry, um, we're constantly, you know, because we deal with, you know, 361 units at my property, residents are always putting their grievances and you know, anything that goes wrong in their unit on social media. So we look at that with like the appliances um, or any type of the vendors that we're using, you know, their skill level. Um, so we have a checklist, you know, that we use that we have to rate and we have to choose at least three vendors. And then we come as a team based on their score and make a decision. That way it's a fair process um, with our uh, vendors. So um, of course in the Bay Bucket it says here that, you know, the assessment can be formal, that they could we, uh, submit like a request uh, for tender or request for proposal information or a quote. Um, and it can be formal or informal, but because we're pretty regulated, we we follow a formal process. That way, um, you know, there's no shady business or anything going on when we're when we're paying people or whatever. Um, the knowledge and the expertise of the vendor. So right now we have a big React inspection um, coming up on the property. So we have really at this moment six different vendors performing services on site. And um, just going through the process to choose the six different vendors and the different meetings, you know, it's pretty lengthy, but we had to use uh, vendors that had the expertise in what we were looking for, um, from roofing, repairs, um, sidewalk, even our landscape vendors. We've, we follow the same price, um, same process with every vendor. Um, one of the things too that's important is are they licensed and insured? Um, 
being in real estate for so many years and not always doing the due diligence, we run into issues when we don't, when we're working with unlicensed um, vendors and it just ends up, you know, is I guess the scope creep, it costs us a lot in the long run. Um, also with our um, vendors, you're looking at my notes here, so sound too bo uh, boring. Um, the terms and the conditions here, uh, the BAVAC talks about that, um, refers to the continuity and the integrity um, of the provided products and services. The organization investigates whether the vendor's licenses terms, intellectual property rights, and technology infrastructure are likely to turn into challenges if the organization later chooses to transition to another supplier. So that's, um, you know, important. And I guess, you know, when we look here at our, you know, I use this and I hope this is, a, is appropriate here. Um, when choosing vendors, you, you have an average score here. You have a scorecard template that you can use and that you can bring to your organization to use uh, to make sure that you have a fair scoring process for, you know, your vendors. Um, Oh, that's my SWOT analysis news. Any questions? I know I'm probably going through this fast and I don't know. <laughs> I can't hear you, Thea. I'm sorry, I muted myself so I wouldn't interrupt you. I said you're doing good. Okay. <laughs> um, so any questions or in you know any feedback on the vendor assessment? How you how do you choose vendors in your organization or maybe some things that um, you know according to Baybot that you know I didn't want to like read it verbatim but uh, you know any questions you may have? Yeah, or a little bit it gives you a nice way to standardize it and you can do your basic math, add them up and figure out which one's best. Yeah. yeah I wanted to understand the score. So add a second layer of waiting um, for bonuses, but also from um, analysis to analysis, the weightings of those may change. So you might have a multiplier um, on different uh, of those categories, broader categories that can change the analysis you do each time based on what's most important for that work. Um, um, we used to do um, some competitive bids and we had to get judged on things like this. Someone else had a question? Yeah, this is Joanna Ferry. I had a question on your scorecard. So this is the, the scoring. Can you give us some more details on the scoring itself? Like the numbers, is five gonna be like high? And yes. Five. So in our industry, um, once we come together and we judge each vendor in the category, um, each person would just, you know, do their own score and then would tally it up. Um, of course, the highest number pretty much wins the bid. That's how it works for us for affordable housing. Okay. And then in other organizations, I assume you would define what the scoring represents, right? The numbers, what they represent. Well, five would be the highest and one would be the lowest, if that's what you're asking. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. No negative numbers? <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> they they don't make it on the list. <laughs> but this, you know, this, like I said, it helps us because, you know, we, we've gone through like just picking vendors like early on, making rush decisions and it's come to bite us um, or it's come to just be like a financial calamity um, within the organization. So we just follow this, a standard process to help us choose what, you know, the best, now, I won't even say the best person to do the job, it's the best score. That way it's a fair process. And when we get audited, um, we've got an inspection coming up 
here with um, HUD, then they can, you know, pretty much see this is our scoring process. This is how this vendor was chosen. They submitted their bid, they submit the information, or we did research um, for the vendors and we pulled, you know, within a 30 mile radius, the vendors who could do the work. And we just did our research and we scored it based on the categories here. Okay, and I will move over to um, the SWOT analysis. Okay. Let's go here. All right, so the SWOT analysis, I like doing these. I think they're pretty cool. Um, is your strength, your weaknesses, your opportunities, and your threats? And the SWOT analysis is a, is a simple yet effective tool used to evaluate, once again, the organization's strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, both to the internal and the external um, conditions. So when we first started our renovation project here with our affordable housing, um, when doing this, the SWAT, we had to look at, uh, you know, the strength of the organization where our company has been around for 23 years. Um, we had to look at the um, our financial positioning and going after the government contracts and doing the, the um, renovations. This here was a I think it was an 18 million, this one particular property was an $18 million um, renovation. We had to look at, um, in examining um, our strengths, just kind of breaking down our divisions from our asset team, our compliance team, um, our risk management team, our human resources team, because we, we took over a property, we acquired a property and we had to put, you know, rebrand the the property to our organization's brand mission. And so having to do that change strategy there, of course, can be um, <laughs> some process within itself, but looking at the strengths that we brought to the table there um, as an organization. Then we looked at our weaknesses in um, within our organization. And I, and I think when looking at the weaknesses, um, yeah, you have to be honest uh, you know, with yourself. You have to be honest. Um, with where you're weak at in your organization, where you could be undermining yourself so that you can begin to build your strengths there. So we also had to look at, while we have been in business for many years and we, we've done multiple renovations, this particular renovation was called uh, a RAD renovation, which was a um, tax credit uh, program by the government. So it was a new program that they were rolling out, which is tax credit in affordable housing. We didn't really have, um, while we had renovation experience, we had no experience with tax credit, which meant that we had to convert um, public housing files and payment systems into the IRS, which is tax, tax credit. So you have government funding, which is HUD, then you have tax credit, which is the IRS um, payment system for the owners. So having to do that, that was one of our biggest weaknesses. And six years later, we are still cleaning up a lot of mistakes. However, now in year six, the things that we didn't know in year one, of course we know now and we're able to um, acquire more properties and to do this renovation and this transition. Um, we also had to look at the opportunities, of course, that were available. Um, there were you know, financial uh, opportunities that were um, available. It was a new market, a new government program that they were they were rolling out that we were the first to one of the first private companies to take advantage of. So that was a new market. That was a new opportunity. Um, with that, we had to roll out new technology um, for this IRS program. So there were a, a lot of new opportunities, which made us um, a prototype for other housing authorities and private owners that wanted to take advantage of this tax credit program. Then when we looked at the threats, um, I had to look at other, of course, affordable and potential tax credit 
uh, apartments within our area there. Um, in the public housing sector, you have a wait list that, that's managed. And even though there's a housing shortage, it doesn't mean that everyone quali qualifies for housing in your complex. And so because of that, you have uh, people who could have been on your wait list where you think you have 20 or 30 new applicants, but none of them qualify for your complex, but qualify for, you know, another complex. So we had to look at, um, you know, the threats, also new affordable housing, new tax credit owners, building brand new complexes, because we did a renovation in our area. And even now they just completed a brand new tax credit renovation. And I had maybe 10 to 20 residents move out of our complex, which is newly renovated into a brand new, uh, new construction. So again, you know, that's like, um, uh, you know, the, the cycle time of moving out and then moving in new move-ins, the loss of revenue every day, there's a loss of revenue when someone's not in that unit. So we had to look at that. And then when we look at our threats, um, we work with the city to see what new constructions are coming. They usually have like a five, 10, 20 year plan because people have to apply for permits to build and permits to do renovation. So we work with this, um, you know, with people in our city to just to look at, um, you know, people that are moving in, our, our competitors. Um, right now, because of the economy, it, it's not really a threat. I guess it's an opportunity because there is a housing shortage, which causes us to be um, our you know our units to be filled at least ninety eight percent of the time. So we have a ninety eight percent occupancy rate there. So um, looking at like your strengths, just kind of going back through um, you know your your SWOT analysis when you're doing that. I know it's more detail, like when you're working within um, your organizations, there's a list of questions that um, you can ask. You can do evaluations um, with people. You could do a survey to just really gain the strength of your organization. Or if you're coming into um, a new organization or enterprise, you want to know the strength because that's going to give you your advantage over your um, competitors there. Um, let's see what else here on my notes. Okay, and, and also a part of your strengths, um, looking at your IT systems. I haven't really worked in IT. I've kind of been on the, the people process side of um, business analysis. And so I've often looked at our relationships with people. I've looked at our human capital, our potential of, of our people, um, what they're capable of doing. Do we need to to do new trainings or bring, you know, conduct new trainings or refine processes there to make us stronger in the in the marketplace. Um, and then, of course, when you have new opportunities, there's more training um, involved. I've worked a lot with, you know, the training and development department. So there's just more training involved in making sure that your your people or the people on your team, you know, are ready for action. They're ready to deploy. They're ready to take on any challenge that comes um, their way. So in, any questions here? I know with, you know, you could, there are multiple layers, um, you know, to, to doing this, but any questions or feedback here? Yeah, I find this very helpful, by the way. This is very, you know, especially the way it's broken down. I, I appreciate how you correlated with the strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. It's very helpful when you when you were talking about it and then you have a visual picture. Um, you I'm able to understand and comprehend it better. So thank you. I have to thank Bob too as well for that. Um, when I started st studying the Babok, the Babok, um, you know, I was just kind of reading through, and I remember in one of our classes he talked about a picture is worth a thousand words. Like, go ahead and do your diagrams and model. So I have my notes now. I've actually broken down the chapters. I'm like looking more at diagrams versus reading words. Um, coming again from affordable housing, our manuals can be very, very thick. So I have to, you know, go through the manuals and break down information. But making it now visual helps me to communicate it a lot faster, get to the point, and get moving. So thank you for that. And thank you, Bob, for reminding me because I would, 
I have like text of documents and <laughs> information. I had a whole notebook of notes. I'm like, why am I doing this? Let me just break it down here into a little flow chart and keep it moving. Yeah, I've actually used this in, in workshops too to help people um, get, get information about strengths of different features. So I've been able to use that to know, get information from people in a workshop. Sounds good. Be good. One, one thing that I found whenever I'm using one of these is before we start mapping who has who falls where in the different areas, we always identify what your target criteria is. For instance, we want to be sure that they rate really high in strengths and no more than medium in weakness. You know, figure out what your where where your ideal person or or group or product is going to rate and then have ideally don't even let the people know that who are rating it know what your target is and then you can say this is how they lay over each other so this is who we decided to go with that way you don't have to have the debate afterwards you have that decision made before and you go in and you rate it honestly yeah, that's 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 really really great. I know um, some years ago we did um, strength finders assessments, and we used to do you know a lot of assessments to find out people's strength. And one of the things I've learned um, when when we did strength finders, you know, when you're moving with your teams and working with the strength versus, versus trying to strengthen the weakness, you get more production or just more energy and enthusiasm out of your team because you're working with their strengths. And so this was, um, I guess with the strength finders, it's pretty much a SWOT analysis, a personal SWOT analysis, you know, and it's just something fun to do because sometimes your strengths change, but um, definitely helpful to, to do that on a personal assessment as well. Very good. There are a ton of sort of psychological profiling tools out there. And maybe we should talk about them at some point. It's a fascinating subject. I've studied a few and learned from coworkers about some really fascinating ones I've not been aware of. So that's an excellent point. Very good. Anybody else have any questions for Bob or Tish? Okay, we've got enough time to do one more today. So let me pull that one up real quick. Well, it works better if I type in the right place. Okay. We're going to go through the glossary, the concept of a glossary. Glossary is uh, the technique number 10.23. Let me share my screen. Thank you very much, Tish. You did a fantastic job. Okay. So literally, a glossary is the dictionary of the terms for your business domain. So I'm gonna talk about two different kinds of glossaries. Uh, whenever you go into a new company, especially if it's not an industry that you've ever been in before, expect to hear new words. Um, there, I've, I've gone into companies where it's like, oh, what's that acronym mean? And uh, you said a word that I thought I knew the meaning, but I don't think I knew it the way you, you used it. Can you help me understand? Sometimes you can go to the trade uh, associations and get a, a definition of the words used in that industry. You know, insurance, tax, uh, legal, they all have their own words that they, that's what they use. Um, fire suppression systems, they have their own words. You've got to learn their language. But whenever you get into a project, you're going to end up with a totally different glossary. It may be that you take some of the words that are applicable to that project. So what you're doing is you're saying in this project, we are using these acronyms, we're using these systems, we're using these terms in this way, and you wanna have it uh, laid out. So it's to provide a common understanding 
for everyone in, within that project, uh, I would suggest that you, you keep yourself two glossaries, one for your industry that you share with new BAs coming into your company, or even you're going to have words that are specific to your company. You know, um, if they call somebody a nickname, they're not going to be able to find that person by their nickname in Outlook. Put it all in the glossary just so if they do a control F, you know, to find, they can find that information. Be their best friend. You'll be their savior in some cases. So you've got one for the company and then you have one for your project. Keep it, keep both of these in a place where everyone that needs it can access it. I don't care if it's Confluence, SharePoint, Teams, wherever. Keep it available, keep it updated, and keep people knowing where it's at. So if you have to put the link to it in your weekly report, you know, here's the, the link for our glossary, here's the link for our vacation schedule, here's a link for our release schedule. Put it all in there so they have it. So let's talk about the elements of the glossary according to the BABOC. Uh, it's gonna be unique to your domain. You can have multiple definitions for you, the term. Uh, if it's implied outside the terms common use or if there's a reasonable chance for, of misunderstanding. Uh, let, me, let me convey one of the reasons I'm so passionate about a glossary. My very first meeting at Quest Diagnostics, I was in a room with, with people who knew more than I did that had lots of letters after their name. And I swear I believed within 10 minutes of the meeting starting that they were punking me because they were throwing acronyms across the table like it was a table tennis tournament on steroids. Um, it didn't make any sense what they were saying. I got to where I learned what they meant, but it took me a long time because they were using things that I had absolutely no familiarity with or previous exposure to. So having this definition, having this glossary that I created just to survive there was critical. So not only was I able to start understanding what they meant and what the ramifications of what they were saying were, but I could become effective for the project. So the glossary is important. Some elements that you need to create to consider whenever you're developing your glossary, the definition should stand alone. Don't say, see this other one down below. Just put everything in that one. If you have a definition for the acronym, also have the same definition for the word and cite the other in it. So you don't have to go looking for what it means. You know, acronym, C, definition. No, just say acronym of this word and then what the definition is. And then for the word, say, here's the acronym and here's the definition. Uh, it takes just a minute to do a copy paste and it will save your bacon whenever you're in a hurry. Uh, again, acronyms should be spelled out if used in a definition. Uh, stakeholders should have easy and reliable access to them. So keep them someplace, keep them where everyone can get to it. Be sure they're not like access only by this specific group. And the editing of the glossary should be limited to only a few people. So keep it uh, protected. So somebody can't go in and punk you or erase it or accidentally, whatever. Um, Make it a habit that if you hear a new word or an acronym in a meeting, you immediately pull it up and update it. If you have, if there's someone who is a SME for a specific area, put that at the end of the glossary so that if someone hears this and they need information, they know who the SME is. So put it all together. So usage considerations. A glossary promotes common understanding of the business domain and better communication among stakeholders. You're trying to really do two things here. You're trying to survive so that you can communicate and be effective, but you're also trying to equip, equip your teammates, uh, other analysts, the project manager, the scrum master, whoever needs to understand what these words mean. You're trying to equip them with the, the tools that they need so that they can be effective in their job. You're capturing the definition as part of the enterprise documentation, makes a single point of reference uh, uh, for the, the entire group to know what that they're all using the same thing. And it simplifies the writing and maintenance of other business analysis information, including but not limited to requirements, business rules, and change strategy. The limitation, a glossary requires someone that routinely keeps it updated. Otherwise, it's, it becomes useless. 
and it may be challenging for different stakeholders to agree on a single definition of, for a term. Uh, let me tell you one time that a glossary would have saved, uh, let's see, eight people, two hours. So four or $500 easily for the company. Uh, we had a meeting because I realized that three different departments had warranties and we were all managing our warranties differently. And I was trying to figure out why everyone was had different processes because we were actually talking about building an application to manage everyone with a warranty for this one department. But this other department already had an application to manage warranties. And this other department had a tool that wasn't an application, but it functioned well. So we got everyone together to talk about how we managed warranties. And within about 20 minutes, I realized that as each group was talking about their warranties, they weren't using warranties in the same way. And so I let them talk for just a few more minutes until I saw everyone was getting frustrated and perplexed and starting to, to say, no, that's not right. And so I stopped everybody and I went to the board and I said, when you say warranty, what do you mean? And they explained it. And I kind of did a bullet list. And then I asked the next group and we laid it out and realized we are not talking about the same thing at all. One of them was warranty before sale. One of them was warranty after sale. And one of them was a totally different use of the word warranty that had nothing to do with a product. It was service only. So because we weren't talking about the same thing at all, we disbanded the meeting because we couldn't use the same tool for totally different aspects of, of these elements. So had we had a glossary to start with, we could have said, but warranty by use, used by this department means this thing, warranty used by this department means this other thing, but nobody had ever had the conversation and nobody had ever created a warranty. Any questions? Or has anyone used a glossary? I'm, I said warranty. Has anyone ever used a glossary effectively in a, in a specific situation that was beneficial? Yeah, basically, I always talk about my um, six cycle framework and you build the glossary mostly as a part of uh, discovery and data collection processes sure. in the conceptual model of phase. So that's the second phase where you figure out what the as is state is. Uh, the kind of confusion that you just described is sometimes inevitable. And that's part of the process. It doesn't mean you fail. That's part of um, you iterate within every phase, but you also iterate in both directions between phases keeping it all um, organized and collated properly through the RTM or a similar tool. Requirements, traceability matrix, if we want to glossarize that term. Yeah. Um, so, and sometimes uh, you won't find out something or uncover a problem like that until you're down the road a bit. So that's a perfect example of having to go back and make things make sense. Right. Thank you, Bob. Okay, we are at the end of our time. Let me share my screen and talk about what we currently have uh, left to do for techniques. Let's see, here we are. So today we did, let's see, we did glossary today. So let me change that. And so you can look and see where the blank lines are and tell me where you can lean in and help us uh, cover one of these. As you can see, these are not hard. They are, they are just, uh, they take a few minutes and sometimes they take a few more than a few minutes, but it's up to you as to if you can spend five, 10, 15, 20 minutes talking about one of these. So we've got benchmarking and market analysis. This is capability analysis, decision analysis, decision modeling, estimation, uh, item tracking, risk analysis and management, uh, sequence diagrams to go. 
and we will be done with techniques. Once we finish with techniques, I thought I would do, I would offer if anyone's interested, uh, we do a, one hour on your LinkedIn profile, how to make it effective and how to use LinkedIn fully. But we got to get through the techniques first. Anybody want to volunteer for one of these? I'll volunteer. I can do one. I don't mind. Okay. Uh, glossary. I just did glossary. Uh, what, which ones? Are, so I uh, I can do uh, risk analysis management. Okay, that's great, Ben. Yeah, I I just finished my senior design project, and then I did. I, I learned a lot about risk analysis and management. I graduated, so that was my senior design project. Awesome. You want to do this next week? Uh, next week? Yeah. Oh, that's my homework. Yeah, that's fine. That's your homework. Okay. Right, so, so, what, so I'm coming up with a topic and then going over risk analysis and management, right? Do me a favor and look at the BABOC and see what it says about risk analysis management and then use whatever you want to to help explain it. Oh, I just have to explain risk analysis management. Okay. Yep. Right, and if you can it. give us some examples, that's awesome. Okay. 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 So, the, so my homework is uh, explain risk analysis management with examples. Yes. According to the BABOC, please. According to the BABOC. All right. Because, cool. because the whole idea is that if people take the test, we want to be sure that they understand what the BABOC says about it. Yeah. If you want to add supplemental or things that you don't agree with about it, that's fine. But they do need to understand what the BABOC says. Okay. And if you need a copy of the Babbock, it's in with the, the recordings, where the recordings of all these are. There's a copy in there if you need one. Got it. Okay. Anybody else want to do one? We have, uh, we have next week covered. How about the week after? Oh, so how long, sorry, how long is the presentation? Uh, anywhere from five to 30 minutes, whatever you need. Oh, okay. Okay. I'm going to use a, I'm going to use PowerPoint. That's fine. Thank you. Appreciate it. I can do sequence diagrams. All right. That's that a fun one. one. Thank you. I've been avoiding that one. <laughs> okay. You want to do that? on <laughs> the Everybody's avoiding that yeah, one. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, I'm not a fan of sequence diagrams, honestly. I've, I've learned that in school. I don't have to kind of struggle with those. Okay. Anybody else want to do one? We've got next week and the week after filled up. It'll be the week after that. Yeah. Yes. It's 510, I think, rather than 511. Oh, thank you. We keep you around for so many important good things. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay, I'm going to save this and close it. And uh, we will close our meeting and see y'all next week at the same time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, so again, so, see you next week. Thank you. I guess the presentation yeah. said 530, 530 minutes, right? Yes, 5 to 30 minutes, whichever yeah. you choose. Got it. Thank you. Thea, this is Paloma. Are we meeting? Yes, ma'am. I'm going to call you. Uh, I'll tell you what. Did you send me your number or am I, am I calling you? Uh, let me put it in the chat. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a good, have a good evening. See you guys next week. Okay. I'll leave the meeting open, Thea. I, I won't end it for all I'll, so you guys can stay on. Oh, see, I, actually, Bob, I do have a question. Yes, what is that? So... So this is I'm I'm going to be joining like I'm going to I'm going to be a, a prominent member and I'm I'm going to go back and get my I be my Babbock membership I'm going to have to have to buy it again because I it it expired I was a member because yeah. I it was like I got it like a year ago I'm like I wasn't really sure if I wanted to pursue it that time I was finishing up school but anyways 